My name is uh, Viken Björkfriström. I'm a consultant here at Netlight and I work with everything related to data. So I've been working a lot with data science, MLOps, and also with uh, quite a bit of data engineering. And with me today, I have my colleague, Albin. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Uh, I'm Albin Sundqvist. I've been here at Netlight for five and a half years. And I started my journey as a full stack developer, but then I've gradually moved towards um, AI and data. So yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, and uh, we're here today to talk a bit about the ML development process and how to make it more mature and sustainable. So as a consultant, you get to be part of a lot of sort of like the first ML journey for a lot of uh, companies. Um, that journey might look different in each company, uh, but there are some sort of like things that stands out that sort of repeats itself in every journey. Um, and that is sort of like the, the first workflow that it works with. You start by, you know, identifying a business case where you want to use ML in your organization. You move on to sort of like building your pipelines where you have to get your data into the right place. You start investigating your data, looking for different type of inference. You build a model and then finally you come to the point where you start thinking about ML ops and want to start to deploy your model. Um, these first four steps might be a bit more iterative. It might not be a straight line as I illustrate for this, but I want to illustrate in a line here because usually, of course, deploying the model has to come at the end here because we have to have a model to deploy before we can actually start deploying it. Um, and what usually happens as well is when you get to this point, you sort of like put on your MLOps hat and start thinking, okay, okay, we have a model, we need to deploy it. How do we do that? And what happens a lot of times is you don't put on this hat until the very end of this process. Um, what I want to talk about today is I want to argue that you need to put on your MLOps hat throughout the entire process to make this process way smoother and for things works better for your organization. So why then? Why should we put on our MLOps hat as soon as possible in our process for when we deploy our first ML model? So let's take a step back and think about the goal of any machine learning project, right? The, the first one that comes to mind, right, is that we have some sort of cost function, some target function that we want to minimize. We want to have, you know, our, uh, you know, perfect predictions. We want to have our forecast to be as good as possible. And this is the first thing that always comes to mind. But we also have a second goal that is equally as important, and that is to minimize time to market. Now, why is this important? Well, if we get stuck in this first step, after a while, someone from management is going to come to us, start talking about fiduciary responsibility to shareholders, and then take the product off. Because before you deploy your first, mo your first model, your team is only costing money for the, for the company. You're not bringing any value. So that's why you also, at the same time as you minimize your cost function, you also need to minimize your time to market. And the problem is sometimes this one has sort of like an inverse correlation, right? If you spend more time on the building a model, it can take you longer to come to market. And also, a lot of times your model will become more complex. And also, that will also increase the time it takes to deploy it and bring it to the market. So I'm going to talk a bit how we can use the ML op hat and then to first of all minimize the time to market by starting putting on the ML op hat early in journey. So first of all, when you start looking at your business case, the first thing you need to do is sort of like establish a baseline for your model that you need to beat to be able to bring business value to your to your company. And then the second thing you need to decide here is how will our users then access the predictions from our model? Is it going to be directly to the users? Is it going to be integrated in some other app? This needs to be decided early on to be able to start thinking about this in an MLOps way later down the line. When we start building our pipelines, of course, we are also thinking about how do we bring, you know, data to start training in the model, but also how do we bring uh, data for making inference in the model once it's deployed? And also important, how do we extract data from our model later for monitoring? These are stuff you can start thinking about even before your model is deployed and already when you start building your pipelines. When we investigate the data, we can also look for patterns that will affect the way we do MLOps later. Um, as an example, you can start looking at uh, data drift. So do we identify this is a model that needs to be retrained very often or not that very often? These are things you can start identifying early on so you know further down the line when you start working with MLOps 
if it's something that you need to consider. And then lastly, when you come to the data science part, that first of all, your first goal should be to try and beat the baseline and not to build the most best model as possible from the start. And also you should go for simplicity over complexity. And now I'm talking about uh, simplicity and complexity on terms of ML ops. So when you evaluate the models, right, you evaluate how complex or simple they are also, not only for building a model, but also deploying the model. We can also use a bit of the MLOps hat thinking uh, in a way to minimize our cost function. So for example, uh, when you can start monitoring the model performance, right? Because we deploy a model, we know that it beats the baseline, but that was on our test data. You don't bring in a value if you can't beat the baseline in production as well. This is sort of like the MLOps version of, you know, it works on my machine. So you need to be able to show you that it actually works in real life and not only in your more data set. And you can't start doing this until you actually have deployed the model. And another thing is also getting early user feedback. Um, you might have certain assumptions that you make about your users and how they will interact with the model, but you won't be sure how that works until you actually deploy it and start seeing how it works in a real life scenario. So we get to this point here. We have, we have built a team, we have deployed our first model, and now we want to move on and sort of like make this ML ops thinking process more mature. And therefore I will hand over to my colleague, Albin. Um, yeah, so how do you actually productionize uh, your ML workflows or products? Uh, so like Viking said, it's important uh, to know um, that uh, once you deploy, it's when you actually give value. And once you deploy, it's also when your model starts to decay. So being able, it's important to find this process where you dare to deploy and find a way to uh, deploy with confidence, uh, which is really this uh, the problem uh, that production ice, uh, is trying to solve. Uh, and you don't, uh, I, I think you shouldn't look way down the line in the future to have this um, super automated um, auto deploy uh, system because it takes too long to reach the market. So you want to find a process where you can incrementally increase complexity. All right, so what's the first step? Uh, a robust repository structure. So leveraging templates, uh, using data science cookie cutters, maybe you modify them, uh, or you use your own repository and that you can then fork when starting new projects from. And you get this nice, um, it paves the way for automation and can ensure these software engineering principles when you develop your uh, models and for example it can be uh, this um, predefined assumption of a test folder within your uh, project that exists and runs some tests when you commit your code or uh, some validation that takes place when you insert data in your feature store but the goal is to get this cleaner code within your repository and instead of data scientists or developers having to each figure out how, how they should uh, set up, build and run tests and validation, uh, you can leverage this base uh, to have uh, examples or maybe standard tests that is ra ran um, in the project, which makes it a lot easier to just add instead of building from scratch each time. And often you get this, uh, what I've seen, you get this tightly coupled code uh, when um, you let it uh, grow organically. Um, so instead have this well-defined structure within your repository that helps uh, with this and let the uh, data scientists iterate uh, over this. The same goes for modular coding, where you, again, can leverage this uh, base structure to have examples letting or helping the data scientists know when and how they should refactor the code and where to place it within the repository to increase this level of 
testable code, but also um, being able to do this productionized, uh, write these productionized scripts that you still can use in the, the same code in your exploratory notebooks via imports, uh, or even move the different modules outside uh, the repository and use in multiple uh, projects. But again, this base repository simplifies this integration of test and validation from the start. And you don't have to do this in the last bit where um, you should uh, deploy the model or think about this stuff. So once you have this um, repository and nice structure, I think it's important to have this shift in mindset as well. So a shift left testing is basically you test things earlier. It's a software development methodology uh, that, yeah, you test things early. But I think it applies well in um, ML projects as well because you need to validate uh, the data. You need to validate if uh, the data supports the model in production. Are you able to use the data? Um, but also the integration part between different systems or even end users and how are people going to use the model. And going from top to bottom, the next one, deploying model versus deploying a pipeline. So this is also an important uh, thing to have in order to have this robustness when you deploy that uh, instead of having data scientists in a laboratory producing this um, model artifact uh, that you handle and move around in different environments, you can have, uh, you should have uh, this assembly line that you move and um, treat the pipeline as the artifact. So the pipeline that creates the feature sh uh, is the one you should deploy and the pipeline that creates the model or deploys the model. This is the thing you want to treat as the artifact, not the model itself. And then the last one, uh, going from model prediction to product performance. So I think it's important to zoom out a bit when uh, the model is actually being used. Uh, you need to measure the right things an example might be uh, you have a um, recommendation model giving recommendations and uh, it gives um, the users all press or like the recommendation it gives, but it isn't actually driving any sales. Maybe the user added the, the items to the cart but didn't buy. So you have to consider the model in the context of its product and the users that are using it. So yeah, what I'm basically trying to say is you should use software engineering best practices and raise your AI maturity level, which is, yeah, um, super easy for me to say and very hard to implement. Uh, but with this well-structured repository, I think this is the nice first stepping stone towards uh, this journey of you being able to productionize your workflows, uh, but also uh, the product itself. So you feel the, um, I like to think of it as this mold, this repository mold, the scaffolding that you fill with good quality code using the software engineering best practices, and then build automation on top of this and move this around in your platform or build pipelines around this structure and, and that really helps you scale things and utilize this um, structure in this best ways but you should always deliver uh, provide value so th this is important for the model the product but also the ml ops side of things so in one use case it might be sufficient to have a person logging into a server executing scripts twice a day, every day. And in some cases, you want to have this super complex uh, auto-training, auto-drift detection, and uh, auto-deploy. And sometimes uh, you end up in the middle somewhere. But it's important to find this tipping point. When is it good enough? And then you move on to the next part, and maybe you automate 
the deployment, but the uh, validation is uh, is manual. So the focus should always be on remain uh, remaining on delivering value, but then guided by strategic decisions on when and how you implement these strategies to best support the project or team's goals and context. So hopefully I'm giving you something to think about. Uh, thank you. Do we have time for questions? As the systems uh, become more and more complex, uh, I find that interfaces between the modules are also something that requires special attention because you really want to exchange just a model or a component, not the whole damn pipeline. The integration part between different parts of your system or... No, but the model exists in, in an environment, right? Yeah. And, and uh, usually, as it evolves, there is not only one model or one component yeah. that you deploy. And one, when the system grows bigger, then exchanging the whole system, releasing the whole system doesn't work. You want to update parts. Yeah. And that's when you need the clean cut interfaces. That's something that I find is very valuable to have in mind. Mm, yeah, and uh, it... Um... When, with this modular coding, or it's easier to think about this stuff as, um, yeah, with inter basically interfaces, it works both in the um, like the different pipelines that support the model, but also, um, yeah, between different systems and models. But uh, yeah, um, maybe if you have something to add to that, or... yeah, I would say it's probably I said the becomes very different beast when it grows the, the product in that size, right? Where in the beginning, it might be more easier to deploy them at fully scalable pipelines, right? But you might reach a point in the product, right? Where deploying a whole new pipeline every time might not uh, cut it. Mm. And then you might have to start thinking about, yeah, restructuring your product, right? Where you can actually have this more modular part where you can exchange the model itself and keep the pipeline. So I would say it's, uh, it's hard to have like sort of like this one solution fits all, but rather you have to adapt it more to, from product to product and yeah depending on the scope and the size of it. Uh, the question is, uh, what about uh, any type of versioning management tool or something like that? Are, are you using that and, and for what purposes? Yeah, so the question, I, I don't know if uh, they could hear you, but the, the question was if we're using any version control. Um, so yeah, um, at my client we use uh, Git, um, Bitbucket. Uh, and... Um, uh, to support the code, and then we have a platform that has uh, uh, model registries, and uh, we use Hopsworks uh, for that, and also the feature store within Hopsworks. Yeah. Uh, yes, you mentioned that it was important to use a good template. I wonder if you have some templates you can share. Uh, yeah, uh, I I like um, the Azure. DevOps uh, um, data science toolkit, I think it's uh, called. But I, I do think you should take inspiration from multiple uh, sources. Uh, look at the um, like the data science cookie cutter. Look at like Google and Azure, and find out uh, like pick your raisins uh, from the cookie, uh, and how can you adapt to your context uh, to best fit your needs. Yeah, okay. You you don't have anything that you all like start out with at uh, NetLite that is open sourced? Uh, no, I don't think so, actually. Um, but that might be something that we should have. <laughs>